ads and maybe a few deletes to tweak some things. So make sure that you go through those ads and uh, you ignore the files that you need to ignore and you can do all that straight from there. So you can right click the file that uh, needs to be ignored and uh, ignore it. Um, and then again, here's the bind, here's the uh, plugin I checked in, Smooth Moves. We decided uh, instead of rolling our own animation system, we'll buy one this time. Okay. Um, so it doesn't check in DLLs automatically. So you'll have to go and manually uh, add those like we did with the initial check-in. So if you forget to do that, somebody's going to download uh, the code and that's not going to be there. So make sure you go through and look for any sort of binaries that get added to your project, especially from plugins from the asset store. And uh, that's about all I've got for this. Um, we're a little over time, sorry about that. Um, but we're going to take a meal break and be back in an hour. I really hope you enjoyed this uh, section on um, ALM. ALM, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I kind of got brain dead there for a minute. You can tell it's lunchtime already. It's lunchtime. I need to get some coffee and some food. So I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I'm David Crook. You can follow me at David Crook, 1988 on Twitter. And uh, again, this is Voyles. I'm Dave Voyles. You can find me on Dave Voyles on Twitter. My name is my Twitter handle. And thanks. We'll see you in an hour. Hello and welcome back to Module 8, Monetization and Marketing. Now it's time to learn how to actually make some money with those apps. I'm Tobias Marks again and with me today is Jason Fox. Uh, if you didn't catch yesterday, uh, I am a game evangelist at Microsoft. I've been working here for about a year now. Uh, before that, I ran my own indie companies for four plus years, uh, making mobile games on all platforms. Yeah, and uh, once again, I, I'm Jason Fox. I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. I focus on gaming, cloud, and client. Uh, I've got 13 years of industry experience doing games, data visualization, graphics, uh, DirectX, and uh, you can find me on Twitter, Jason G. Fox, or uh, follow me on my blog, jasongfox.com. Very cool. So now we actually want to know how you're going to make some money with games. It was coming up yesterday a lot in the chat. People say, how do I make money with this? Yeah. So, Let's go over what we're going to talk about. We're going to say, okay, what is an indie exactly and how are those indies making money? We're going to go over app store optimization, uh, which is if you don't know that term, you will know it by the end of this talk. That's my main goal, so we're going to cover that a lot. And we're going to talk about apps as a service industry and exactly what that means. So first off, how are indies doing it? What exactly is an indie anyway? Uh, people were asking about that in the chat before. Indie is uh, independent developer. That means that you don't have any publisher behind you. You really don't have any safety net. You make a game, and if it fails, it was your money. You know, if you're a big AAA studio, you have some funding, you have some investors. If the game's not popular, you might not get hired for a second time, but you're still getting your original paycheck. Indies are kind of out there by themselves. That's a broad term. It could mean a hobbyist, someone who's working you know, one or two man devs in their home. It could mean a small team, 20 people, self-funding, uh, and everywhere in between. Uh, but that's okay because these indies, they're able to do it. They're competing with big apps on the store today. This isn't just, you know, small side projects people are doing in their own time, you know, getting a couple little you know, extra pocket change. These are number one apps are yeah. indie made. The way I define it is just somebody who is not contracted with a publisher to build a game. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, right. publishers that's are, a huge scope of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So these self-published games, these small studios, sometimes as small as one person or you know, even just two people, are reaching the number one slots in stores. They're making serious money. And they're competing with the big guys. They're competing with the AAA studios. They're not just competing relatively well. They're doing better than these guys that have sometimes million dollar budgets behind their game. So is it what just are, luck? What are some of these games? Can we? Oh, I mean, like Three is probably one I've been playing a lot lately. That's been uh, super popular. Uh, Angry Birds was an indie game. Absolutely. Right? Uh, Minecraft is probably Minecraft. one of the biggest notable successes of all time, practically. Yeah. Flappy Bird. Yes, definitely. For what that's worth. Yep. 
you know, these, this isn't just, uh, as I said, not you know, one or two apps every now and then. It's yeah. very common to see th uh, indie apps top the charts. Um, so those apps succeed not because, well, a bunch of apps release and somebody rolls the dice and they are lucky enough to be selected. There's a science behind which apps make it to the top of the stores, which apps make money, and which apps don't. Too many developers I see talk about, well, it's just luck. I made a game, this guy made a game, that guy's successful, I wasn't. It must have just been luck, right? Well, yeah. there's a reason why they send out, and you can't just clone to succeed. Too many people say, well, Flappy Bird was successful, well, Angry Birds is successful, I'll just make a game like that, release it. Why wasn't mine successful? Well, that's already been done, it's already been seen, it's already been shown. You have to stand out, you have to be unique. If you search the store right now, you're gonna find so many different Flappy Bird clones, or what's that helicopter game he just came out with, uh, he came back after. Oh, I... It's already been cloned I think like, already, a dozen times at this point. I think they cloned it before he even published it. Yeah, exactly. So, what we're talking about here is not about, okay, we're gonna do marketing, here's where you have to spend money. Here's where you buy ads to market. There's all these traditional marketing ways that just involve dollar spends. We're not saying, here's how to spend money on your app. We're talking about marketing with zero budget. We're talking about marketing with nothing and having similar levels of success to games that have those big advertising budgets. So how do you do that? Number one way, app store optimization. Have you heard about this, Jason? I have. Um, most of, several of your talks, actually. Most developers great. I talk to, when they're first getting into the industry, they don't really pay attention to this. So app store optimization means your presence in the app store. Now, whatever when I say app store, I mean any app store. This could be the Windows store, it could be the Windows phone store, it could be the Xbox page, whatever gateway they have to get to your app. In a digital distribution age, no matter where they find out about your app, if they get recommended from a friend, if you're the number one in the charts, they just find you through search, they're always gonna be funneled through this page. And that page will have your icon, your screenshots, and your description. Now, do, do I need to optimize the same way for every store? Is, do the same general principles apply? Um, the same general principles apply. There might be some keywords that work better in one store versus another. Okay. But really, once you start thinking about this stuff, you're gonna have a leg up on your competition in a big way. There's so many games out there that these developers will spend sometimes years of their lives working on it, perfecting it, making it better, and then when it comes to release, they have the intern write up a description in a day, they look at it, okay, that seems fine. Or, for example, the icon. They'll take an icon, they'll make a really nice looking icon, they'll show it to their artist friends, they'll maybe show it to some focus groups, and they'll say, this looks great, and then they ship it. But it looks generic compared to other ones in a store. It's not a gaming example, but I like to use a to-do list as an example when I, I talk about this. So many to-do list apps out there have a checkbox for an icon. So if so, we're gonna publish Zombie Pumpkin Slayer to the store, mm -hmm. we need to have a really great icon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> something like that, right? Yeah, but no, exactly, it needs to pop. So let's, let's use, a, actually, instead yeah. of my to-do list apps, let's use a zombie uh, one, it's a great example. There's so many zombie games out there if you have your zombie app as a picture of a zombie, and it might be a good looking zombie, but if it's not gonna stand out against all the other zombie apps, if it's not gonna look at a screen of not just your icon, but 50 other icons, and yours doesn't pop out at me, I'm not gonna click it. I'm not gonna be interested in it. It has to have that 10 foot test where I look at it from 10 feet away for half a second and know that is a good icon, that is interesting, that is cool. Cool, great. Next is your screenshots. Uh, I have up here on the slide an example of Temple Run, which is a really great game. Most of you guys out there probably have played it, but even if you haven't, you can look at this screenshot and you know exactly what's going on in the game. It has a guy running, there's coins in a straight line, I can see there's room to left and right where I can go and collect them. There's some enemies behind me chasing me, and it says swipe to turn, jump, and slide. Now it's not giving me full instructions, it's not saying swipe up to jump and down the slide. I'm just getting the general idea, I can hold this in my hand if this were a phone, I can see my thumb moving back and forth, I know how this game feels, I know how it plays. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of information in that one screenshot to mm -hmm. show you what that game's about and, and how you can have fun with it. I mean look at the water texture there too. That's yeah. not a really good water texture actually, that's kind of not the best, most pretty screenshot they could have picked. They could have very easily done this pre-rendered scene with the guy running into a temple, like Indiana Jones style, trying to grab his hat as he was sliding under a door. 
but they didn't. They used an actual screenshot from the game to show what the game's going to be like. Because if they had used that cooler screenshot, maybe some other people would have downloaded the game. But then they would have been not what they expected because they didn't know what to expect. Was it a third-person adventure game? You know, how does it play? And if it's not what they expected, it's not what they wanted, they'll uninstall it or, even worse, rate it badly. And that's going to hurt you in the App Store rankings. It's going to hurt you in the charts. It's going to hurt your monetization. So it's better that the only people who actually download your game are people who are actually going to be really engaged and want to play it. So you need to be as honest as possible. Even if honesty is not as pretty as you can make it, honest is more Should important. Should I put a screenshot of my game menu? Uh, no, really. I don't see why a menu yeah. is that important. Unless your game is about menus, you're some type of right. baseball management sim, you really don't need that menu. You need an example of what the gameplay is, and it's clear and concise in one image. Again, the Temple Run is a great example because it has all the different elements of the game, and I know the nature of the game. I even implicitly know the goal of the game just in that one screenshot. And the more you can make it clear, and ideally in that first screenshot, the better chance you're going to get that the person who downloads it is someone who's going to be a player who will monetize well, who will stick the game, who will like it, or even just download it in the first place just because they know what it is. Last thing I want to talk about is the words, the description. Again, people just ignore it. They think, okay, this is a cool game. It's got 30 levels. It's awesome. Well, 30 levels doesn't mean anything to me. Does that mean I'm going to play it in 30 minutes? Does it mean it's going to take me five years to be able to master? Uh, it, you have to have a little more context. Here. You have to have a little more call to action is why your game stands out as unique, why it's better. But also it's got to have keywords because the first people who are going to read it are not humans. We'll talk more about that in the next slide. Should I take the full write-up description of my game from my game design document and just paste it into my description? And <laughs> is that a yeah. good idea? Wordy is never a good thing. If okay. your game design document is the one-page game design document, I've been to a lot of talks at GDC lately where they pitch instead of having these big 500-page Bibles, if you can pitch your game in one page or less, okay, maybe then you can copy some of that in. But again, you have to think about the keyword optimization. That brings me to my point, optimizing for search how will they find you? So like in, in Zombie Pumpkin Slayer, you just run around and you just slay pumpkins. Should I just put that in the description? No, because there's should so many be, games about be zombies. Like you want to talk about zombies and pumpkins and all those things, right? But right. you have to have key words of what the game actually is. Because remember I said, the first people to read the game is not a human. It's going to be a robot. It's going to be a search engine. Just like your you know, Google, your Bing, whatever search engine you're using, they read the web first, and then when I'm on the store and I'm like, I want a zombie game, I'm going to search zombies smashing, or I'm going to search pumpkin kids game, and I'm going to find different keywords, and based on the search algorithm, whatever that may happen to be, whatever the magic sauce they use, they're going to figure out which games go up in that chart, and the higher you are in that search result, the more natural downloads you're going to get. So this isn't something that you can guess. This isn't something that you can write and in a vacuum say, this is good keywords. You have to do your research. You have to actually go to the store, look at other zombie games, look at other pumpkin games, look at other games in the type of category that you're in, and figure out, well, does this game stand out? What keywords are they using? What is the game that doesn't stand out? Rank 100, what words are they using? How frequently, how frequently would they use a phrase like endless runner in a description? You know, do you use it once? Do you use it three times, emphasizing it? Well, when you submit to the store, you can submit certain keywords. Say you're doing um, some kind of trivia game. You can submit trivia or family, or you could submit family trivia. So if I'm searching for family trivia, the person who has those two words together in their key phrase, they're going to go up the charts higher. But if you search for family, they'll still appear if you only have the family key trivia keyword not quite as high. So you have to figure out what's important for your game. What keywords are most likely what people will be searching for to find it. Not the name of the game necessarily, but someone randomly searching on the store. Right. So if I make a Flappy Bird clone, should I just put Flappy Bird in there, even though it's maybe something else Flappy or some other? Well, most style? app stores are kind of against the idea of you using another game's name in the title. Um, so I would advise against that, but I would look at Flappy Bird. I would look at your competitions and look at how they describe their game and try to describe your game similarly. Because if how people are finding Flappy Bird 
if they don't necessarily remember the name Fabio Gord or just simply if they're searching for it. If you have similar keywords, you will appear in similar search results. Now, this isn't permission to copy and paste. I'm not saying to, you know, spam as many keywords as possible. Anyone have like a WordPress blog out there and it just gets comment spam after comment spam of, you know, 500 lines? 